Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Podcast, a podcast about getting out from behind the keyboard and just talking. Each week, we invite a guest or two to sit down and talk about their life and their work. I'm Christopher Brown, your host, and this is the Cross Border Interview Podcast featuring Lisa J. a surprising thing that I've just come to realize that all these shows that I watched as a kid as even like in the 80s all these voices were Canadian and I just yeah man Nelvana was the shit I'm so surprised at that though because it's such an unknown thing now because you don't realize that all these characters are Canadian voices and they're on American shows yeah, and then see, and then America, I think, got hip to it because now they've got a big voice. I was down in LA for like a decade and I did more theater and stuff because I wanted to like just branch out. Like, and so I'm crazy. Like, I, I left Bakugan battles. Like, I had that offered to me and I left like another thing with the powerhouse. Like, they people, I angered people, but I was just like, I want to try different stuff, you know? And so, but if you want, I can hook you up. I don't really keep in touch with Allison from Resident Evil too much, but um, I can hook you up with, I can put in a good word for like Maya who played Phoebe on Magic and Keisha who played um, Keisha on, what's her name? Sukrani. She's in the States too. So I could like hit them up on Twitter. They're on Twitter. Hey, I, I, oh, well, I've been going through like list of Canadian uh, voice actors and FYI, we're in the interview now. <laughs> so, okay, great. So we're just, we're, because this is how I like it. I like just a conversation between two people because so do I. you don't, you don't see that Twitter has become su- such a toxic place that I just like talking to people. Um, I am not into all that social media and stuff, but I do keep it up because like, some people are like, oh, where did she go? I wish I, and I was like, okay, so I'll make like some like social media stuff. But yeah, it is so toxic and it, and I can get like really, really emotional for no reason, so. I, I can as well. But uh, I, I, to, to really get into the nitty gritty of this, it's yeah. where, where did your passion to uh, entertain come from? I think it was honestly always in me. Chris, like, um, I started dancing. That's what it was. I started dancing at three years old and like I was top ballet jazz. And then something like somebody noticed like, um, my great aunt or my grandmother, something was like, Oh, she, she's obedient. She's like an obedient kid. Anyway, I went to these, like, it all started from my memory at three years old, going to a woman named Margot Lane Talent. And it was just like basics, like teaching you to like say hi to the camera and this and that. And then she actually pulled my mom aside and she's like, take her here. Um, because I'm, I'm really like not doing her any service. I got my first commercial with Margot. Um, Margot Lane talent and it was for Simpsons and we had to run and we were still with the old streetcars and I remember that vividly like it was yesterday that was my very first commercial then I went to um, so my mom followed that lead and she took me to my very first agent my only agent up until um, oh my god we have like a 20 plus relationship Um, Sandra Newton at Edward G agency. And from there, it just was auditions, bookings, and then auditions, bookings. And then it led, it was all commercials first. And then they sent me out for voice commercials. And then my first voice was Babar the Elephant when I was like five. We are going to get into Isabella here. (laughs) But (laughs) but as a kid, Well, I can just remember myself as a kid. I always yeah. went against what my parents would say to do. Hey, we're going to go do this uh, audition for you. For me, I'd say, nope, don't want to do it anymore. I want to do my own thing now. Did you not rebel a bit against your mom? Or were you like, yes, I'm enjoying this. I'm, I really want to be potentially an actor or a voice actress. It never, ever, you know what? Wow, this is like an existential metaphysical conversation that I'm glad we're having, man. I love these <laughs> I feel like I've known you for like years already. Um, Hold on, I need to take a swig of my Coca-Cola. 
Go for it. But hey, if Coca-Cola wants to sponsor any advertising on the show, they can. <laughs> Free publicity. They really right should. There. Everybody mentions it. Um, so um no, never was that's really? so funny. You mentioned that. No, never said, Mom, I don't want to do this. And I remember there was a time that I they asked me, would you give your talent for a charity? And like my mom got so mad at me. I was like, yes, I'll do everything for free. And my mom's like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Oh my god, you're bringing up so many good. Can we talk like on a regular just to keep my sanity? Let's do it. I'm okay with that if you are. Okay, but we will. I'll keep it touching. Because- okay, so, but one thing I will say is um I actually wanted to do a lot more acting. And actually my mom's like your grades are slipping. So anytime like I didn't bring home, it was such I did an interview with somebody else about Metabots and it's like, it was, it was a chaotic, um, it was a chaotic uh, upbringing. And if you can get her and Nico Bonsawin, she's like a sister to me. I lost so many like touch base with so many people. And like, and we look back on it cause she started acting when she was two, three. And we, we hit the twenties together and, and we were like, what the hell? What was that? Like we were children. So these questions are amazing. No, I never rebelled. In fact, my mom wanted me to focus more on school and getting a real job. So so she was pushing you through this, not pushing you, but she was guiding you through this process of uh, auditioning with your uh, manager, with your talent agent. And she was still worried about your grades yeah. because you don't hear that from so many parents of uh, young actors and actresses. They're more worried about, hey, you, you're, hey, you can bump? make it. When's your next paycheck? And I wish, well, you know what? She's like, wow. Like you only appreciate, I I stopped looking at my mom as a mom and more of a woman and being like, how did she put up with me? But no, it was never about that. It was like, we're Japanese. You better bring home A's. Oh, you don't get A's today. Oh, like, you know? And so that was a big deal for me. I really fought against that. With her. And just just on that note, uh, yeah. there is a uh, and I'm, I'm going to stereotype here, and I do apologize sure. for that. But the tiger mom, the shark mom, the helicopter yeah. mom of in the Asian uh, community was that mm-hmm. with your mom when it come to came to your grades? But when it came to acting, it was more like you're going to do it, but you're going to do it for a price and not for free. <laughs> Yeah, she wasn't like, okay, that was just like a one off, you know what I mean? She was good with that. She was good with that and everything. So let me try to describe my mom. Um, You want to know something? She was a single mom and I was the baby and she had two older people. So, oh, God. um, Did you get away with a lot of stuff? Oh, yeah. Back in the 80s, she would just literally drop me off and I would fend for myself. And I remember other stage moms would just pick on me. Like there was this one thing I did, this musical and my mom was like, I was 11. Now that I look back on it, Chris, like I was 11 taking the subway. Like I was going to TV Ontario to shoot a series. And they're like, why are you always late, Lisa? There's this British guy. He's like, you know, we can find another character name. And I was like 11 and I went to the bathroom and I cried. And I was like, maybe it's because I'm coming from school after a math test that I had to bust my ass all the way up to Young and Eglinton from like Donlands and Danforth. I don't know. Oh God. So yeah, no, my mom was like, this is what you want to do. You go do it, but bring home the A's and get a real job. I like it when you like um, stop going through this phase. But I think around like 21, she's just like, oh, this is not a phase. Like she's, gonna be serious about this yeah yeah well that, well it's good that she let you do what you wanted to do but still grounded you enough right because so many yeah. people that i talk to aren't grounded in reality and it sounds like your mother had a big influence and grounded you into the person you are today and able to do something like this and just shoot the shit yeah at the time i hated her but now that like i'm an adult i was like oh she's actually like she let me do what I wanted to do, and and she made me fend for myself, you know, on sets. Like, I was a child in a set of, like, adults. I remember this time I was doing another show uh, for TV Ontario, and, like, the, I just, 
I don't know what I did. We did a first run and he came down from the booth. And whenever the directors come down from the studio booth, you're in crap. And I was hiding in this mask. It was like an arts and craft show. And he just ripped me apart. I was like 10 and and I knew that my mic was on. So I was trying to, I was hiding behind this mask, like just choking back the tears. And he's like, do it just like you did it in the audition. And I did it. And then like, obviously we wrapped and he came and hugged. He's like, that's wonderful. So like my mom wasn't there on sets a lot. Um, around the time I was like 10 or 11, able to use the able to use the public transit in her opinion she's like listen i had a job when i was 10 then you could get you could get on the bus you're spoiled what do you mean you need to drive to work i was like okay so she did ground me and with the money thing like um i always had to work i was like what about my acting money no nope. <laughs> if i let you have that money you're just gonna blow 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 and I'm glad she taught me like that. But at the time, like, wow, I really wanted to like use my money to buy all the cool clothes that I saw my other people going out to auditions with. I had like, like frizzy, frizzy hair. Like I wanted to go to the salon and get it silked out and like not be made fun of for my fro, like all this stuff. And my mom wouldn't let me have that. So I also had to start working at the age of 14. I'm not painting a great picture of her. She's awesome. <laughs> I, your, your mother sounds amazing, but it sounds like you had an amazingly horrible childhood. Of Thank you. Work, work, work. I'm just noticing it now. I was like, hmm, why did I start smoking cigarettes? <laughs> um, as a child actor who is yeah. potentially between the ages of three and let's say 12, when you're going on the Toronto subway system and train system by yourself which i still won't do at, 20, at 35 i won't do that but anyway <laughs> oh my god it's ridiculous <laughs> did you do you look back at that time and think because you you talked about there how you were crying because the director was yelling at you do you look mm -hmm. at back at that and say it was a positive experience or a negative one because yet again we're only talking about one negative experience but overall Oh no, it was a you lot. must have enjoyed it to continue going. I must have. I must have. You know, <clears throat> I must have loved the make believe enough. And um, you know what I think really did me in? I had my play. It was Mordecai Rickler's Jacob Tutu and the Hooded Thing. And I was six years old. And, and dancing. I think really did it because you would look out in the audience and you would see people smiling. And I think that for me was always like, wow, somebody smiled, you know? I didn't realize like how, you don't realize like what you're in the middle of when you're in the middle of doing it. So I didn't realize that the, all of that was abnormal until like I took a break from acting period. And I, like I was 25 and I was like, I've never not done anything. And um, I took a few years off, much needed few years off. And I realized like, I'm still realizing like, hmm, that's not the average, you know, I think if anything, I have some sadness now wondering what would have become of me maybe um, like emotionally and mentally, maybe I would have become a little bit more stronger or something if I had an average normal upbringing. But no, I must have liked, I must have loved it somehow enough. And I think it is the live theater for me. I think I like, I think like the voice was fine and dandy and, and like the television and everything. But I think it was just like, the work and the prep and the culture of like live stage because you're like together for eight to ten weeks and you see everything being made and you go through the choreography and all the rehearsals and I think it was just like the process of acting that I loved and like to get my tidbits here and there to fill that void was like voice commercials and tv film and I would be the same that I was there. I was always asking the director's questions, the producer's questions, and I wanted to know like the animator's jobs and stuff like that. So I think it was, it was something in me that I really wanted to do. So 
I, I don't know how to properly word this question, so I apologize. Just word it. I'm not. I'm highly. I'm not highly offended. I just. No, no, it's not anything bad. It's just I don't want to. Like I don't want it to mean something that it doesn't mean. Um, sure. Do you consider yourself a voice actress, or do you consider yourself an entertainer? I would say theater actress. Theater actress. Mm -hmm. Because that's all I want to do. Even now. today, you, you still want to do that. Yeah, yeah. That's what I like. I spent the better portion of my adulthood doing was like unpaid theater, you know. Um, so let's throw another like wrench into it all. As six years old, seven years old, I was diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and that hampered a lot. Like it was the eighties early 90s, I'm Eurasian, ethnically ambiguous, you know? So I had casting directors and my mom tell me like, oh, she's just perfect for this role, but she's Japanese. And I went up against that. And then when my body started crippling from the rheumatoid arthritis, my, my jobs became less and less. And, but still everybody in the voice community remembered me for my voice. So that's how it kind of became voice actress, voice actress, voice actress. So I was like, oh, I'm still dreaming about Jacob Tutu and the Hooded Fang, you know. Do you find okay. that even today it's hard? Mm, because we, we, we try to be uh, politically correct in 2020, uh, 2021 mm -hmm. when this airs, but we try to be politically correct. We try to... Uh, there, there seems to be a need for change to stop whitewashing everything in this world mm -hmm. and allowing Japanese people to be more prominent or people of color, indigenous Any people. people to be more pro exactly. Yeah, indigenous people. Yeah. Like, I mean, um, so when it comes to like being physically disabled or differently abled, whatever the pop word is right now um there's a lot more strides to go um but people of color and indigenous people like the sick and lgbtq to be fairly like represented in that you know i grew up and i was just like thank god for the gays on the set like they just took me under their wing and like that's where i got a lot of my nurturing from um but we still do like <sighs> I don't know. I've been watching Ratchet, Nurse Ratchet lately. Yep. And I was like, that's a guy who gets it right. Um, Mr. Murphy, whatever his name is. Ryan Murphy, yeah. Ryan Murphy, like he gets it right. The Bellhop, it's set in the 40s, whatever. But the Bellhop is like a darker, a darker, deeper tone skin person, you know, and there's no explanation about it. Like that is where we need to get to. But um i think like i've witnessed in the last decade myself how great inclusion has come it, we've got a lot more further but it's not of just like representing actors you need to have the decision makers you need to have the execs and the writers and the producers willing to tell the stories you need the people like the lee daniels the spike lees in that room making decisions of like no this is who i'm going to cast and i don't have to sell it or explain it but and yeah you've you've made it a conscious effort because if i'm not mistaken through interviews through research on you and i spent a good few hours actually a few days going over every potentially interview i could find with you you to, cray cray i hey i go in depth but i don't have questions these are just questions that you and i are talking coming up with yeah okay. um you you have made it an effort from a very young age after uh learning about your rheumatoid arthritis mm -hmm. uh diagnosis to make the union change mm. and that's what i find so interesting because it takes one person to start a movement right we, mm -hmm. yet again, I'm just using this as a paraphrase, but the Viola Davises in Nova Scotia in, yeah. the, in the 20s, the Rosa Parks, the Martin Luther Kings, right? It takes one person to make a movement. When you started to make that change in the union of the diversity uh, portion of the union, I apologize mm -hmm. if I don't get the right name. Oh, neither do I. 
do you remember yeah. it being a big deal of we yes. need this, we need to I actually make people understand that we are here? So I okay, so I hid my disability until I was 21. And by the time I was 21, I was like sick and tired of not getting jobs because I was ethnically ambiguous. Like, you know what I mean? And I am a girl from the hood. So all my people and my friends are afro Caribe, like, do you know what I mean? And like Asian Vietnamese. And so I went there to represent people of color and LGBTQ community. At that time, it was just LGBT. But um, yeah. And then when I was there, I was like, holy, I met a couple of people who like use wheelchairs and stuff like that. And I, I'm, I'm like, they're like, oh my gosh, you're on the show. And, then, and that's when I realized, oh, maybe I could say things like, you know, and do some good with this. And if the you get, oh my gosh, yes, I can't tell you things that I've been sworn, you know, to keep yeah. private. Um, but I will say, um, it's been, it was a fight, but you know something, I can't make this all about like inequality because we have allies in ACTRA and thank God for our allies. But like, I really had a great mentor, shout out to Jenny Lazon. She's amazing. Um, she's my mentor when it comes to all of this politics stuff. Cause I was just, she's like, you want to join the diversity committee? And I was like, I'm a loud mouth. I'm not political. I don't know the buzzwords. And she's like, even better, <laughs> I'll school you. And she schooled me, but I have to give props to my Caucasian allies, my male Caucasian straight allies and women, you know what I mean? Who helped us push through the glass ceiling. Um, what we managed to do is we managed to get some casting directors from Los Angeles to come out and see people, only diverse people who identified as physically or ethnically diverse. I was part of a sunset clause. Um, it was an international thing and it helped actually bridge SAG and ACTRA together um, for people of disability. But I will tell you, you to get back to your question of like the challenge, there's one part where when I was on council, I wanted it mandated that there has to be some people who are of genuine disability who will get a call, not even a job, just get a call for an audition. And I was on that phone and I was calling long distance from Los Angeles because I was in LA at the time. And I remember this one woman saying, well, I only got two commercials this year. And then we kind of smoothed over it. And then she popped up again. She's like, so does this mean that I'm not going to get a national commercial if I don't have a disability? And like, that's the kind of meetings I was attending yeah. in, in direction to people of color, indigenous. Oh, I went off screen. Um, people of color, indigenous females, um, different like sexual orientations, trans rights, you know what I mean? That just, just made me livid. So yeah, it was, it was a lot dealing with it when I was in council and I, but uh, fuck, I represented. Do you I think did. it's come a long way to actually where uh, producers, casting agents are actually taking time to make an effort, not an effort, but the conscious decision to say, you know what, we will see able bodied, differently able bodies, gay actors, straight actors, black actors for this one role. We don't care. We want you mm. to be the best person you are. I can't say, well, since the time that I started advocating from like the early millennium, yes, it has definitely, there's initiatives there, you know what I'm saying? Um, but my biggest thing is like, you don't want to be the angry mob that wants a job just because like you feel left out. You have to bring the goods too, right? Like I'm not gonna, I'm not. And so I think that's where a lot of like executives and writers who make it in the room, you know, oh, now am I gonna bring up human rights issues or am I gonna like keep food on my table? Do you know what I mean? So it's just like, <sighs> Oh, I'm flooded. Repeat the like. Repeat it again. And I, I'm gonna keep on moving forward here because I have another question in my head, and I want to ask yeah. a question. 
Did you ever at any moment after you came out publicly with your diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis at 21, did you ever think that's it? It's the end of my career. Hell yeah. Really? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I wanted to, when I was 14, like there was so much tension growing up in that household. And on top of it, I was like, no, I don't want to live a lot. And she's like, you're my mom said like, and again, looking back on it, at the time I hated her, but now I understand. Like, uh, she's like, your phone's gonna stop ringing. I was like, it will not, I'm talented, oh, you get jobs. Ah. 21, I came out of the closet and I was like, I've got rheumatoid arthritis and Sandy, bless her heart, and Yannick Landry, bless his heart. They're like, that's what it is. You're so emaciated, because I was, I just looked like hell. And I wasn't getting the proper treatment that I am on today. Um, but from 14 to 21, I was petrified and my phone did stop ringing and jobs became scarcer. Not only are you a child actress, try like you're, you're lucky if you make it out of puberty. And then on top of that, I'm like, Hey, I'm disabled. You know, there's something about that, that people just don't want to touch. I became a leper. And then I was like, screw this. I'm going to be the best that I can be. Because like, oh, your question was, have you seen the shift to people who are just up for one role and they're person of color, LGBTQ, and it doesn't say it in the description, right? Yeah. Okay, so that coincides with what we're talking about right now. So I was like, screw this. I'm going to get so skilled at what I do that I'm going to do what I love that my talent will speak for itself. Like that's wishful thinking. That's hopeful thinking because there are politics in, in this it's show business. It's not lovey dovey coming to like fruition. <laughs> you don't <Exactly>. say <laughs> so, it seems so roses and happiness all the time. Down and <laughs> and rainbows. Yes. So I did, I, I like, so, okay, to answer your question, it has improved, but it's not gonna, until there ha, like, until there stops being initiatives, like we're gonna have a workshop just for you people. That's when you, when those stop, that's when you know, okay, we've achieved equality. When and, we don't have to have these kind of handout workshops, appeasing workshops. Well, and I, I couldn't agree more on you with this because I was actually just talking to my husband today about this, okay. like this exact issue. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like everyone's trying to appease everyone to make it seem like they're uh, okay with everything. But at the end of the day, if you don't need the workshops, then you know you've actually made it and it's not uh like a different playing field for everyone it's an equal playing field when everyone just treats everyone the same and it doesn't matter what your basis of your skin color your sexual orientation your abilities it doesn't it shouldn't matter right however the also the other thing that you said is like our producers and writers like making a conscious effort well it would be lovely like to make a conscious effort but also what I have to say to the LGBTQ community is like they are organized. Y'all are an organized bunch. Like even when it came to like the AIDS epidemic and the medicines and like how you guys like would run the, the antibiotics, like, like y'all and you guys got into government. And that's my motto is you want to see change. You got to infiltrate the system that you want to change and dismantle it from the inside. You're not gonna attack it from like an us versus them sort of thing, you know? And that's why I, I don't wanna come across like I'm bitter or I think there's like the industry is awful. No, not at all. It's a job. You gotta have the goods. You gotta have what it takes. Sometimes it's historically not befitting to have a crippled girl of Japanese descent in like, you know, Ireland. Like, you know what I'm saying? But that's why I love theater. Yeah. Because in theater, I have played like all, like it's so politically incorrect that it's so politically correct. That's why I love theater. I think that is also why I love theater so much. 
I don't have to deal with all of the bull crap that I have to deal with in like the business money making side of it. Plus, at the same time in the theater, if you screw up, you know, you have a do over the next day. You, <laughs> you can change it. Like if you give if you go in, you give a bad day's worth of acting on tape. Yeah, that's, that's it. Right. So you have that ability to adapt. And uh, from someone like get again, I've not done it to the extent that you have, but who has performed live in front of people before. Mm -hmm. I know that the, the, the crowd, the crowd also yeah. is oh, so totally. much different energy. Totally. Have you ever performed in front of like a scared crowd, a, a crowd that's like scared to like clap or like laugh or something? Yes. <laughs> Isn't that totally. the worst? Because you get the one person in the back is like, <laughs> yeah. Like, do They're we like not? Do we not clap? In. <laughs> and because, especially, there's sometimes in the scripts where you there's actually times when you you expect to laugh at one point and then mm -hmm. it dies, and you're like, well. <laughs> This exactly. is and then they come and see you after and they're like that part was so funny i was like why didn't you laugh yes. I'm like, i didn't know if i was allowed i was like oh my gosh yes of course so you have had a extensive your resume is extensive with canadian shows that i as I was reading, as I was researching and listening to you, like listening to all these old shows, I was taken back. Like you said, Babar. Yeah. The raccoons you were on. I know. I don't even remember recording that one, but I that was one show that I was always had my dream. Wasn't that the best show? Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes, it was. <laughs> Sunday night CBC, right? CBC oh. was awesome. You oh had my God, Fraggle Rock. Fraggle Rock. Yes, Mr. Dress Up Fred Penner. Oh, yes. Oh, living down old memories right now. Yes. And oh, and you just sit and it was like so Canadian. Oh, I loved it. We Canadians are such an extensive, we have so much talent, but yet yeah. again, because we are so influenced by the States, they don't get out that much. I know. Which and which it sucks. took me, yeah, and like honestly, it did take, like my agents did not want to see me go, um, and then I I went to uh, another agency, they didn't want to see me go, and I went to Los Angeles. Um, I didn't. So twenty one, you were saying like, were you scared? I was petrified. And I didn't know, I was like, should I go to school for theater here? And like doing it here didn't make sense to me. Cause like you said, like there was so much extensiveness in it, you know? One more thing is if you go to school for theater, again, it's the grades thing and keeping up. And I just wanted to work. I wanted to work. Like I always did from the time I was in diapers to whatever. And so I took my butt to like New York first. And then I went to Los Angeles and I really thought I was going to be there for two years, but they are, they were so open-minded to my limp and my, like my missing jaw and my crooked hands and stuff. And, and, and like, I just kept getting gig after gig after gig that I just went for my like working visa and everything. And the only thing that brought me back was like my health and I couldn't afford the healthcare over there. Like I'm on these like huge biologics that saved my life. So I, you can't enjoy anything if you're feeling like crap, but um, yeah, 21, I was petrified and you were talking about appreciating Canadian talent. And that's why like, even like this is important for me to do. And like, I, I, I am like in texting and messaging with people um, all about, I was like, if you need an interview or something, if you are a young artist, I'm gonna help you or whatever. If you need me as a guest, I'm gonna help you because it is like you said, like we're, we're, it's what happens here? Why do we have to go to the States to feel, there are so many Canadian, you think that could, the Canadian industry was like a force. There are so many Canadians in LA. I and didn't it, even know that. And it shows you like even this year, a Canadian show, best oh, comedy yes. Emmys, like it mm -hmm. shows you Canadian talents here. It's just, we have to market ourselves better down in the States, right? We have to market yeah. ourselves as, we are the, like, we have Canadian, like, Canadian comedy is such diverse here. And it's so rare. It's so unique. Exactly. 
I just find ourselves like Canadians need to do a better job at marketing ourselves. And like you said, I'm so happy that people like yourself are willing to give time to uh, independent Canadian artists who say, you know what, if you want an interview, let's do it. Let's chat. Oh, yeah. I'm like, it's su such a reassuring thing because yet again, I've talked to people who have been in the industry the same amount of time as you had. And you get the cold answers of, yep. Oh, that, yep. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Oh, it was a great experience. Couldn't have, couldn't agree more. And you're like, well, this is fun for an audio you're interview. The second, you're the second guy who interviewed me. Really? I said that. Yes. There was a second. He's like, yeah. Some people are just like, thanks. Bye. Like to them, it's just like business done, you know? And I'm just like, no. I don't know. I think it depends on the person. I don't know. Oh, exactly. So, <laughs> and you are, and yet again, we've only literally chatted for the last half hour so far. <laughs> you seem like this is Lisa in an interview is Lisa on the street. I'm not going to get yeah. someone different. And that's, that's what I like about people is because yeah. via Twitter, you get like 140 to 280 characters. And you're like, were they happy when they wrote that? Were they sad when they wrote that? Like, I don't. No, they were planning when they wrote that. <laughs> Bingo. Okay, um, so raccoons, Babar, okay. Rupert. Yes. Like, as a young person, as a voice actress, you don't know these shows are going to be huge when you're doing them. Or did you know when they were airing, you would be potentially recognized for your voice? Because... As a voice actress, mm. your face isn't there, so people aren't going to know who you are, but mm. you have a voice that people might re remember. Um, I know that Bad Bar, well, for me personally, Raccoons was a big deal. <laughs> I was like, ah, Raccoons, Raccoons. I Every Canadian will agree Raccoons. with you. <laughs> oh, I wanted them to bring it back. I wanted to be the girl. I wanted to be Penny. Mm -hmm. Was it Penny? I think so, yes. It's something like that. I can't believe, like, my mom, like, I, that was a big deal. And then Baba, I remembered it was a sweet deal. I don't know how to describe that because my mom read me Baba storybooks. And then Deb Toffin, I remember she was like, come here. And we watched the opening together. And I, I remember just like, I was like five, six years old. And I just remember just that music like, do, 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 do washing over me and it was just such a beautiful experience um and it, cbc i think when they said that it was on cbc i knew in my heart like wow this is like pretty cool you know but you don't ever think like in terms of oh national big viewerships or whatever you're just like i got to do this on a channel that i watched the records on <laughs> that's what it was for me so during this time, you're going to school, right? You're going to school when yeah. you're recording Babar, the raccoons. Mm -hmm. uh, like, are you kind of, quote unquote, bragging to your friends? Hey, if you listen to CBC Sunday morning, you might hear me or <laughs> you will hear me on this show or you will hear me on this show. Or were you sort of a subtle person just to say, yeah, I'm doing this and it's what it is. I never talked about my voice work. Never. Um, but I was missing a lot of school. So the teachers hated me. And like rightfully so, you have like this kid just walk in and out, like, you know, when it comes, it can come across, even though it wasn't, um, as I'm going to show up when I want. And this, like, I wouldn't like it if I was a teacher trying to teach. Like, that's not a good example to us, like a handful of schoolyard impressionable kids, right? Yeah. But the commercials are what got me bullied. Like you're a show off and this and that. And then I remember this one day and it taught me a really great life lesson. So if there's any kids out there listening who are five years old, listen up. I'm about to drop some golden nuggets. Yes. <laughs> so I learned my lesson of humility when I was like, well, I am on a commercial and you're not. And oh my God, the gloves came off. And I was just hated from that moment on. And I learned. Do what your mom said. Don't talk about it at all. My mom was a very wise military <laughs> and uh, yeah, 
military esque by letting you go on the TTC at eleven exactly. years old. Exactly, and like so. you don't talk about it. She doesn't even talk like that. Like you don't talk about it. You shut up. Okay. So well. when did you know that you could change your voice into different ways that would allow the casting agent, the director, the producer to potentially get these parts because at a young age, you're always trying to do new voices, even if just make your mom and dad laugh. But how did you know that you could potentially change your voice into different scenarios? Well, I think um, when I was younger, they wanted just that genuine kitty sound, like real kid sound. And I could read, that was the thing I could read. Um, so that was a plus reading at a young age. I've been holding in that burp for a long time. It was from the Coca-Cola. So now I can speak more liberally. Um, but when I was like 10 or 11, I started going out for little boy. Like I was like auditioned for things like Rupert, you know, but I can't manipulate my voice as well as Julie Lemieux. Like she is amazing. I, to this day, have trouble doing a, a boy voice. I don't know if it's like I get self-conscious or whatever. I don't know. Maybe better now, like maybe I'm less self-conscious because I've had theater training and like I've done male impersonation, but like at that age, I didn't realize I was manipulating it um, as well. I think it was, they wanted that really genuine child voice and that's what got me the jobs. And then when I was 10 and 11, I could just like throw on a Valley girl for like Ashley. They're like, oh, we want a Valley girl for Ashley for sticking around her and like, and the hardest ones for me, I think I did like Little Rosie and I played her baby brother and I did Childlike Empress and I played like the Rock family's baby and like just graveling. You know who I have to give hands up to? My voice directors. Because when I went in for the audition and stuff, I would do it and then they would be, take time with me and really help me and teach me how to craft my voice. So I don't think I... I I think I took direction well, and I think that's what made me viable. And that gives you a good direction. reputation as well, because if you're willing to take direction, especially in the industry, I'm mm -hmm. assuming if you don't take uh, directions well, you're not gonna get the next job with that director, that casting agent, that producer. So if you're willing to take directions at that young of age, you know that you're going to potentially stay in for the longevity of potentially a few years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or yeah. however long you're going to do it. So yeah. have you ever been up for an audition or a part where you said, I, I know I've gotten it. I'm going to do it. This is a cakewalk. I'm just going to walk in. I'm going to do it. They're going to hand it to me that moment. And then they go, that's not how we were envisioning it because as a voice actor, I don't know yet again, that's why I have you on the show to talk about this. Oh, how do you picture a voice before doing it? Because that would be the hardest part for me of you're reading this part. You don't know what they sound like. So you're coming up with it. Yeah. I. There's a lot of questions in there. <laughs> that's okay. That's cool. This is just like the most awesome fun time I'm having. Um, <laughs> Ah, oh, let me see. Huh. Okay. There is one sticking around, you know? So um, I was like in my teens, I think at that time. And so, yeah, I would do voice. Okay. Yeah, you're right. When I was in my teens and stuff, I could still do like baby um, and young boys. So I did that. But that was when there was making a movement from like less cartoony and da -da -da to like, like take it easy, like the more like reality grounded voices. I really thought I had that one in the bag and um, turns out I didn't and that's fine. Not every part can go to me. And actually I walked out and one of the producers was like, you can't get everything. And I was like, yeah, you can't. Um, so that was one where I thought that I really had it and I didn't. And also I auditioned for Power Puffs and I was doing Everything that the breakdown was telling me, I was doing everything that the voice director was telling me. I was doing it a high pitch. I was doing it like um, they wanted sweet and lighter. They wanted it higher, higher, higher pitched, right? And I, I guess I just didn't get it. And that's just a lesson. Like not every role is gonna be for you. There's like, have you ever been on the casting side of things, Chris? Uh, yes, but it was for an independent like high school, no university movie that we produced. 
Well, that's important. I mean, I would like less college. To be in any- <laughs> I would love to be in a college person's film. Like that's big. <laughs> Honestly, I'm starting the is. hashtag now. I'm <laughs> Lisa J for college films. That's kind of a weird. <laughs> Let's this do is it. The, oh, wait. Oh, <laughs> for appropriate. What kind yes, of college? For appropriate for college. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. How did you find out about those college films? Um, No. What was I saying? So, yeah, yeah not every opportunity is going to be for you. And then I did some casting for like, um, thank God I did casting. I get it. It's like you've given the direction. You want the person. I know. I, I knew this person. And they needed a film credit. And I was like, you got to do it like this. And I was literally coaching. And I was like, come on, let's be this outside. And, you know, we liked him. We really wanted him to have that part. But then in walks a person. And they don't take the direction as well. They still take direction. Like you say, it is important to not be a jerk in the room when you're auditioning. But like, but they're just the character. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, there's been times when, I feel like I did everything, I did everything. But then somebody comes in and they just are that character. So have you ever watched a show that you were up for a part for and you listen to the person who got it and you go, I can see it? Yep, totally. Powerpuff, sticking around. I was like, I did not do that. I tried, but it wasn't computing. You know. Does, does it push you a little harder to make your make the changes that they're potentially looking for because you're always trying to improve yourself you're always trying to make yourself better so you can get that next part the next time so when you're listening to other people who are voice actors you're going yeah i can take what they're doing there and i can use it for myself or do you just be lisa jai i think that i take the breakdown and i do what i can do best with it and then I just got to accept that if I don't hear back from them, there's whatever reason. And I truly did my best. I won't, I won't ever try to like mimic another person's performance from, don't think that I use the word mimic. Like I'm not offended by the question at all. Like when I was watching Powerpuff, I was like, oh, they did. They wanted to alter. And of course I might try it out a few times or whatever, but I think that can cause such mental illness in a human being especially if this is all you've got (laughs) especially if this is all you got going on (laughs) as a career like i really i did i would i would beat myself up i'd be like what was it what was it this was and i would do that and i would practice and i think like um around like a few years ago i just stopped that i just stopped that because like you're not not every opportunity is going to be my opportunity. And I'm so glad I had that experience like from behind the lens or like producing theater where it's like even the people I wanted to get it just aren't going to get it. As if there's so many moving parts in a production that like when you have when the creators or the showrunners have the big picture in their mind and they really would love for you to be part of it. But if something, if, if you're not a part of that moving like mechanism, it's gonna throw the whole thing off, you know? I don't think that like the, um, I ever lost a part and thought that casting got it wrong or I could have done a better job. Um, I think like in theater, I've thought that, but not in voice. I think there's so much time and effort and money put into things that like the casting, like, I watch it, I'm like, that's a masterpiece. Like sticking around is a legendary, like I could never do what that little little child did. Puff, Powerpuff, that's a masterpiece, you know? But you got your masterpiece too. Thank you. With the legendary, the still running on repeats every day. It seems like it's on every streaming service. The Magic School Bus. (laughs) You lucky. Like this, like to walk into that is just miraculous. Yeah, it is miraculous. It wasn't as big when it was first out until now. Yeah. When when you were doing it, take me through the process of how this even came about first, because I think most people want to know because Magic School Bus, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't even books before the TV show, if I'm not mistaken, or if it was, it was one or two. 
It was books. It was Scholastic. It was, I mean, I never heard of it. Uh, but I, you know, you do you remember going to grade school and getting those Scholastic flyers? Yes. Okay. So then they're like, it's a Scholastic book. Scholastic? So then I was just like, okay, cool. Um, I think the voices that kept like that, well, that's not true either. But like, so they wanted high energy and then listen, talked about masterpieces and moving parts and like the person with the vision, you know. So they that from the first audition to like pilot was like a couple of years. And we really? went through so many, yeah. And like they had like they had the few main characters on locked down, but then they weren't sure. So they kept on circulating and doing pilots with all these different people. And then season one was kind of iffy. We weren't even show, sure if we were going to get picked up. And then we got the news that PBS got picked up, picked us up. Yep. So then we did um, series, series one. We did season one. And then I think the um, Fox Kids picked it up. And then it became a bigger thing because Lily Tomlin was on it. And then they had like um, Dolly Parton. They started Dom DeLuise. They started bringing in like, you know, classic acts to guest star in it. So, And then it went on for a few years. These, but in hell no, I did not know what I was getting myself into. Correct me if I'm wrong. Most of the kids on that show were Canadian voice actors, right? Yes. Every single one of us, every single one of us until um, good old Danny Timberelli came in from the States. And um, he's such a great guy. I want to like, I'll shoot you his info too. But, um, but Amos, you know, um, he, he, he aged, his voice aged. Like I said, like from the time it was a pilot until it got up and running, took a few years. So, you know, we're going to sound a little bit older. Plus at the same time, like you said, even there, Puberty does change your voice. So oh, yeah. it, it's a fickle business that you're in because if your voice changes once puberty hits, bye. Bye. <laughs> so so Lily Tomlin wasn't there, right? She was recording no. it. That must that probably was probably the least like the worst part about it is the kids are all doing it themselves. They're in they're doing the voice acting together, and Lily Tomlin's recording somewhere else, right? You know what, though, by that time, I was so used to, like, recording on my own or, like, filling in the gaps. Because when we did Babar, it's not like Gordy, Gordy Penson I was like, hey, kids, I'm going to come and read my lines with you. <laughs> really? Yeah. You're just blowing my mind right now about Gordy <laughs> Pinsett. <laughs> oh, my God. Every time I see him, I harass him. I'm like, do you remember me? And clearly he doesn't. Like, I was this kid he never met in a studio from a show for, like, 50 years ago. I'm like, you're my first TV dad. <laughs> Every single time I saw him in the States and they were presenting an actor award. And I was like, hey, dad, <laughs> like, he should be scared at this point. I'm like, Just I love going, like, of no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> You should be scared. Take a take it on like a restraining order on me. So during the magic school bus time, you mm. must be thinking, I've got it. Like, this is perfect. I could do this. This is easy. This yes. is like money's coming in got a job are you still going to school at the time yeah hardly yes <laughs> hardly just, going just to school. graduated yep but Bouncing keeping your grades school. up <laughs> yes a very nice c average <laughs> i'm assuming your mom was happy about that yeah she was so thrilled no at that point she was just like i give up just just do this it is what she's gonna do you know she i think that's i think magic was when she realized oh crap my kid really wants to like my yes. kid thinks that this is gonna last forever that this gig is gonna last forever and you know there's only so much mothering that i i was a really rebellious kid so i think that's when she was just like you know what you want you want to do this girl you do it and so um so 11 years old, we did the pilot, then we found out, and it was something that lasted like until I was like 17, 18. It was, a I was good... going to say it was a good run there. Oh yeah. At the end it was of so it, much fun. when you got the news that it was ending here soon, things were Wanda Lee would, would forever be engraced in everyone's mind and Wanda Lee's brother will be forever graced in everyone's mind. Yeah. Was it hard? Was it hard yeah, to walk it away? 
It was hard. Um, I'm so glad I brought my little camera and I took pictures of us like in the last season, I think we were together. And I'm so glad I did that. It was hard because like talking about hitting puberty together and like, like the show was good to Amos Crowley, the original Arnold. Like, you know, they brought him back as like a guest, uh, even though his voice aged out, like we were really sorry about Danny Timberelli. Like we went out with all the parents and stuff. Oh my gosh, you're bringing back so many good memories, Chris. I'm but, glad um, that I can do that. It was hard. Yeah, you're, we, went to, to, we went out to eat. We, it was really great. And like, I went through my own stuff, like trying to, juggle school and um daniel DeSanto was working on like a film and he like he pulled an all-nighter and then he came in to record the next day and you have to be at level like a hundred for voice on a show like that and like we would root each other on and like we would talk about things that 14 15 16 year old kids go through you know so there is a bond so when that came to an end i it was pretty devastating yeah. You move on from that and you get voice actor job after voice actor job. You are still in the industry. You're still getting jobs during this time. Mm. Uh, you then hit yet again the mother load of video games. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which, yet again, you don't know what you're auditioning for. You're, you're not a video gamer. I understand this. You have never played the game. <laughs> but you get the a part of Sherry Birkin, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Resident Evil 2. Uh-huh. I had no was idea it, what I was going for. Was it a different acting experience from television to video games? Yes, it How was. How so? Uh, more grounded in reality. There's the horror aspect of it. Keeping whoever is playing the game um, enticed, entertained, suspenseful, um, not knowing, not even seeing anybody else's. It was so secretive, Chris, like didn't even know the title. When it was released, they didn't even let us know. You know, there was no hype about it. Like you said, like these things have aged like fine wine. They become more notorious as time has gone on. Um, but at the time I had no idea what I was doing, but it was so different. Still the same like voice manipulation, but the difference was like, oh, I didn't know. Was it I, your first video game that you auditioned for? Yeah, and then right after that, I guess they liked me enough and they brought me back for Dino Crisis, which I've never played either. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we couldn't afford no PlayStation. What are you talking about, Chris? <laughs> same here. We had Super Nintendo and that was the max. <laughs> We had Atari <laughs> and like we would fight over it. She's like, you want your Atari? Here's your Atari. And like she like broke it. <laughs> that one joystick and one red button. Woo, yeah. <laughs> no A, B, A, B, a down, up, Z, quad. What's that? Exactly. No? no, so yeah, it was good. But like hands off to like Susan Hart. I think the voice director was. So it's me alone in a booth and like, like serious Japanese men sitting in the back and like silence. Like, you know, usually, you know, when you say a line, you record it, take one, say the line. Okay. And then they'll say, okay, we want this. And no, there was like five minute gaps in between every single take. And that to me is not good. I'm used to, Great, got it. Moving on. It like in the fight, and I, I think like I always thought I was going to get fired because I was like, "What's taking so long for them to approve the line reading?" Um, but no, it was just a communication thing. It was a translation thing. Though you know, you were asking me like, "Did you know you were in something big when you were doing Babar um, and stuff?" No, but when I was doing this, I could feel the intensity of it. Like there was something in the air where I was like, I've never done a secret project before. That's cool. I've never done a video game. My homeboys are gonna love this. And um, I've never worked with like an international team in Japan and being Japanese, I was so freaking like, I was living. 
So, so um, yeah. When you got the part, the game comes out. You don't know what the game is. Mm -mm. When's the first moment you realize that you're in this game? Do you remember that moment? Legit. <laughs> Sitting up in like, you know, you always have like that one or two houses where there's no parents home ever. So I'm sitting up there and I'm like hearing myself. I was like, okay. And I was like, where's the TV? And, like, oh, no, play the TV. No, play the TV. and so I go over to the couch and I was like, what is this? And they're like, it's Resident Evil. They didn't say Resident Evil 2 or anything. I was like, that's me. Like, hell no, it's not you. And like, I couldn't prove it or this is that because I don't know if they made it to the end of the game. Anyway, I bounced from that. And it was only years later, years later, when the 25th anniversary was coming up, they're like, like, I started getting tagged and stuff like that. And I was just like, wow, this is a big deal to people. And then I got this call from Crimson Head podcast. And he's like, I would love for you guys to like, come on for the 25th anniversary. They're going to make a remake. And I was like, oh, that's great. And then all the drama stuff. Oh, who do you think is better? Who do you think did it? I was like, I am not here about that. Like, I lose parts to like people all the time, all day, every day. Like, don't do that to that that actress who's going to be playing Sherry Birkin. I would not have liked that. We constantly regurgitate things, storylines in, in in storytelling. So come on, get over it. Don't don't bring me into that drama. And um and so that's and now I'm talking to you about it. I apologize. I didn't realize it was such a big thing. I just realized we just went over the hour mark. Are you still good to chat? I'm so good to chat. Okay, perfect. Because I know you yeah, got a long day to mark. Horse. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm going through radiation therapy right now. Are you, babe? Oh, yeah, I, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor on my birthday this year. Mm -hmm. So if I, yeah, like I'm like all my, yeah. So that's why I'm that's why I'm drinking a lot. So that's why I'm just trying to water my mouth. So I apologize. Probably not what you need to hear about, but here well, we that's are. That's okay because I'm on anti cancers biologics too. Yeah. But nothing what you're going through. Oh. So, oh, I so. can't wait to meet you so I can give you a big hug. Virtual hug. Uh, well, next time sweet. I'm back in Ontario visiting my family, I'll call you. Okay. okay well, <laughs> also energy levels. So if you are good to keep talking. I am. I'm actually very good. It, this is this has been the best part of my day compared to what I was dealing with this morning. So, Lisa, <laughs> you are a godsend on this you're, November you're 10th. Too. Oh, you're fine. Oh, Chris, I just like I, I like I like you 10 times more. You're such a warrior. OK. Um, so you have Resident Evil. You just mm. realize that like it's mm -hmm. such a massive hit now. Mm. Um going then you like you said you have dino crusaders i apologize Dino. you know what paula from dino crisis that's what i've memorized paula from dino crisis so do you remember <laughs> all the names of all the like things that you've been in no um there was this like there was a time when like i started abbreviating my especially my voice credits and stuff so i've forgotten a lot of things i was like what else was i on like i need to like fill pages and look like i'd done some work because like all i put on was like resident evil and magic school bus and i was like no no, no i gotta add more credits now <laughs> Thank you once again for listening to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. If you love this episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast, head over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast and subscribe, rate us, and leave us a review. All the links to our social media accounts are in the show notes or visit www.crossborderinterviews.ca. The Cross Border Interview Podcast was produced and edited by Miranda Brown and Associates Incorporated. Be sure to tune in for our next episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Once again, thank you. Whoa!